The next talk is by Brusta and its River Crab Harmony and Euphemism, a peak at Chinese online culture under the censorship. Please welcome her with a great round of applause. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you. Thank you. So just a reminder before I start the talk that I'm going to use some graphic, vulgar and explicit language if you have young children with you or if you are easily offended, then I highly advise viewer discretion. Also, I'll mention a lot of new words in Chinese and I will try to repeat the meaning every now and then, but what, if it gets too confusing for you, um, you can just shout out and don't, I don't mind being interrupted. Um, so we start the talk with some music appreciation. So, did you notice who were in the song? Anyone notice? Who were the, what were the animals that were mentioned in the song? Yes, and? Good. So what is grass mud horse and what is river crab? Well, in the following 40 minutes, I'm going to explain to you a handful of selected terminology, incidents, and phenomena that one might encounter online in China from cultural, historical, and linguistic perspectives. I will try my best to untangle the complex layers of humor, resentment, resistance and creativity of Chinese netizens that I have followed closely in the past decade, while at the same time you all know that the censorship by the government started to climb down tighter and tighter. Well, sit tight and here we go. So grass mat horse in Chinese raise cao ni ma. Read after me, cao ni ma. Good. Cao ni ma is a near homophone of, which means that it pronounces the same as cao ni ma, which literally means fuck your mother. <laughs> it's Chinese people's favorite cursing phrase, often referred to as guo ma, national curse. And people have, using, have been using this phrase for a very long time, until 2009, the river crabs infested. So river crabs in Chinese is pronounced as he xie, which is again a near homophone of the word he xie, which means harmony. And the word harmony comes from the phrase harmonious society, he xie shou hui, which was a social economic vision that the ex-Chinese leader Hu Jintao brought up in the mid-2000s. However, the methods taken to reach this goal, this harmonious society goal is to delete all the unfavorable voices against the party in all media. Basically, render the term he xie, harmony, as a euphemism for stability at all costs. The standard is completely arbitrary and you have no idea or you have no right to, to decide for yourself. Um, so this is basically how online censorship in China started. And of course, soon after, people started to treat to harmonize as a placeholder for, to censor. So instead of saying harmony, people started using just as a joke, river crab, when their online posts get deleted or when they're mentioning any sensitive issues or simply uh, criticizing the Communist Party online. So that means that so people just say, oh, that's Rivercraft, hence the title of my talk. Um, also, actually, the word crab, apart from the same pronunciation with harmony in Chinese, it also subtly hints at to bully because crabs walk sideways and the sideways in Chinese is hung and which has a double meaning as hung means to 
fully. Um, and in a picture, you can see that there are three watches on the crab, which refers to three representatives, because representative, again, in Mandarin, um, is, is um, 代表, which is the same as um, to wear a watch. So three representatives is also a concept that brought up by then Chinese leader Jiang Zemin in 2002. And it means that the Communist Party represents um, the advanced social productive forces and advanced culture and, um, and the interests of the overwhelming majority. Except for that it is not the truth. So instead of saying three representatives, people started to jokingly, jokingly saying, wear three watches. So now you understand that um, Cao Ni Ma, this grass mud horse, this cute little innocent looking animal actually means the F word. And the river crabs, the bullies, are what takes the unharmonious online contents away to censor. So this phrase is apparently not enough. People also made up this character on the left, you can see, following the general rules of how Chinese characters are made. So top, bottom, left to right, and you see the grass, mud, horse, they're all embedded into one character which is a very subversive act, and I also find it ingenious. It's like people are erecting a monument and saying, fuck you, censorship. So I don't know if you notice also that there is another point in um, the song that the habitat and the battlefield between the grass mat horse and the river crabs is called ma le gu bi. Again, homophone. It's, it means um, your mother's vagina. At the same time, Gobi also is um, Gobi Desert, which is an actual region in northern China and southern Mongolia, um, known for its dunes, mountains, and rare animals, such as no leopards. So it's kind of real to have animals like grass mud horse or river crabs. As you can see by now that um, in um, Chinese, that it has a lot of conflict the complicated nature of Chinese language, both in written and spoken form, um, it contains, it, there are certain characters that pronounce exactly the same while meaning very differently. So when you want to censor a word in this written form, people always can come up with different other phrases with the same pronunciation to circumvent the censorship. And it can be understood depending on the context. So after I explain to you the linguistic aspects, there is in fact also a cultural and historical layer of the irony of the um, of irony of about the song. So the melody actually comes from the theme song of the Smurfs when it got introduced into China in the 80s. And people were like, oh, we need to have our own theme song. So two um, patriotic songwriters who normally works for the Communist Party wrote this song. And all the kids who grew up in the 80s or in the 90s watching TV like I did um, are familiar with this song. So when people adapted the melody, to describe, to narrate the, the, uh, the battle between river crabs and grass mud horse immediately called on people's ears and spread virally. Um, the same year, Cao Nima got so popular, it does not only spawn an industry of videos, cartoons, and stuffed toys in China, but also it got some international attention. So it got mentioned by the jury at the biggest media art festival, Place Ars Electronica, that was the same year when WikiLeaks got the award of distinction. Starting with this pair, Chinese netizens compiled a whole collection of internet mythology, which originally contains 10 mythical beasts of the internet and is expanding ever since. It first appeared in 2009 on Baidu Baiku, which is an online Chinese encyclopedia um, run by Baidu. I guess many of you have heard about this, which is the almost only search engine people use in China. So I will briefly introduce another two um, examples of the mythical beasts, just to give you a taste of how the, they are created. 
So the first one, Fa Ke Yo. Fa stands for French, Ke Croatia, Yo squid. And Fa Ke Yo is known to be co discovered, a species of squid co discovered by France and Croatia and um, heftier, appetite in Euro uh, heftier habitat in Europe. When agitated, it is said that they are going to release a form of white liquid and cause great harm to human. So I guess you understand that without me having to translate it. Fa <laughs> So, um, well, that's the transliteration for fuck you for those who don't get it. <laughs> Another one, yam uh, ye It helps if you understand Japanese, because it comes from a Japanese phrase, yamete, um, which means to stop. And, or if you watch a lot of Japanese pornography, that you would probably know this word as well. And it is a stereotype of Chinese towards Japanese pornography. Basically, you know, the girls are very submissive. They always say stop, stop. So, um, which, uh, and again, Japanese pornography is a very important part of people's life in China because um, there is no sex education in schools or from parents. So that's how kids get their sex education. Um, the next one I'm going to talk, oh, actually one more mythical creature, which is Gu Gu, um, the ancient dove, known to be the ancestor of all birds, currently on the verge of extinction in China. Though rumor has it that they are going to revive as dragonflies, so according to American, Native American legend, the bird has a very important habit, which is don't do evil, and which can be translated into Chinese as feared river crabs. And the, during the period from the end of the 20th century to the beginning of the 21st century, it once spread all over the world. But after March 23rd in 2010, um, they slightly they started to disappear in mainland China. The abnormal behavior of the bird is suspected to be linked to the recent global extreme climate change. And especially the large-scale ecological, environmental, and geological disasters that have occurred frequently in China. Encountering problems, it did not survive as well, as robustly as grass mud horses did. Therefore, they chose to migrate to Hong Kong. And coincidentally, in 2010, all Google search services was removed from China to Hong Kong. So this was a watershed in development of Chinese online culture. Since after Google left, um, Baidu pretty much dominated the search engine market. When Google says that don't do evil, it didn't really know how much evil a search engine can do. Um, so Baidu just demonstrated that to them. Fast forward to 2016, um, on Chinese quarrel-like question and answer website, Zhihu, someone asked, what is the greatest evil of humanity? And there, here is an answer from a 21-year-old Chinese college student, uh, student Wei Zexi, who posted about himself receiving treatment for the rare type of cancer he suffered from. And um, at this hospital, he found from the search result on Baidu. And uh, eventually, he realized that the words that he received treatment from wasn't even qualified, and the treatment he got was not as effective as it was promised. So he passed the best opportunity to receive proper uh, treatment, and he condemned Baidu as the greatest evil of humanity and he passed away not long after he posted this answer. So this scandal, of course, led to a public outcry, and people were really edg um, angry about what Baidu did. Well, arguably that it was not only Baidu that led to his death, but also the regulation of the government, or the lack of. Um, however, it did point to what people, in general, like a lot of people have suffered from, like they cannot get, relevant information on Baidu, and a lot of people just uh, wondered when will Google return to China. And um, last August, there was a leaked document from Google that revealed that they were working on a project called Dragonfly, which means it's a censored version of the search engine targeted at the Chinese market. 
and um, a lot of people ki were kind of happy, a lot of Chinese people were happy about it. However, then in November, there was a letter co-signed by a bunch of Google employees. Um, they, were post they posted a letter on Medium and saying that this project is against the principle of don't do evil, and we pledge to drop the project immediately. However, um, while many people did praise them for upholding justice, however, um, no one really talked about what Chinese netizens were thinking about at the time. And here is a, whoops, sorry, here's a response letter um, found on GitHub, which is one of the very few international platforms that are still accessible in China without a VPN. Um, so it, Presumably a Chinese programmer who posted this in both Chinese and English, and you can also find this letter on Hacker News. Um, and they, he basically was saying, like, oh, we want Google to be back regardless whether it's censored or not, because we hate Baidu so much. Um, and I really liked, if you find this letter on Hacker News, I really like the comment section because there are so many arguments that perfectly demonstrated the complexity of the ethical um, issue of tech companies operating in China or other, outside China. I would just read out a few. Um, so some people criticized the open letter from the Chinese programmer saying this argument is so wrong that why do we deal with a massive shit just because there is even more massive shit in place at the moment, fix the root cause. And someone countered that argument saying, it's easy for us to scream human rights when we aren't the ones that don't have access to a platform that has changed our daily life. And then someone remained neutral, and, but they, he also said that it wouldn't be a net negative even if um, Google censored part of it for getting into China because it's still 100 times better than Baidu. So I don't know. I know that um, in the audience, I think many of you work for some important tech companies. I don't know this question about ethical issues uh, come across your minds, how often it does. But um, I would insert an unsponsored ad here. If you're still here on Sunday, at 1 PM at Curie Tent, there will be a talk exactly about this, like the ethics or and ethicality of today's technology with the, with the title Why Nobody Cares and Only You Can Save the World by Willem Klein. So I think this is a very important question that all engineers should think about. So after the search engine, let's talk a bit about social platforms in China. And Douban, launched in 2005, played a very important role in the development of Chinese online culture. And I personally spent a lot of time on there as well. So as a social networking service website, users can create entries of films, books, uh, and music, and movies. Um, sometimes also the ones that are censored in China, if, you, you know, if the admins didn't pay attention to. So it's kind of like a combination of fandom, Goodreads, Reddit, or, and Meetup all together on this website. So it was very influential, and many intellectuals were on there for social discussions, and it made Douban an easy target for censorship. So the admins decided, oh, in order to keep the website running, we have to self-censor at some point, and they did. And however, in 2009, um, as we mentioned earlier, when the river crabs started infesting, things got a bit out of hand. So some admin at Douban removed images of um, a Renaissance paintings uploaded by a user because they considered the images inappropriate. And the user got really angry and started a campaign called Gei Minghua Chuan Yi to put on clothes on famous paintings. And so to ask the other fellow users of Douban to um, upload photoshopped images of famous paintings and put on clothes to cover the news. So that, um, well, I mean, that's, that's a very good act um, in response and in protest against the self-censorship of the platform and also to ridicule it. Um, but eventually, all these pictures, again, and discussions got removed from the platform. 
This confusion of whether nudity in artworks is inappropriate or not continued. Three years later, um, CCTV, China Central Television, <laughs> the predominant state television broadcaster in mainland China, um, reported about a Renaissance art exhibition at National Museum of China, and in the broadcast, a picture of the famous David Apollo sculpture by Michelangelo was pixelated at where his penis is, as you can see in this great capture. Um, so basically, the stuff of the state media, the state TV broadcaster, basically says, "Oh, this is this sculpture is a pornographic image," and you can imagine how embarrassed our students must be. So three hours later, however, at the rebroadcast of the news, the pixelation got removed, and many um, at the time the media was still relatively free, and many media picked it up, but CCTV never responded to that. Um, this is not over yet. The pixelation. So last year, the state administration of press, publication, radio, film, and television or in short, Mini True, says that the entertainment programs are too bad for kids nowadays. Look at all the guys, they are having tattoos and they're wearing earrings and the girls are dyeing their hair like crazy. So this is what you see nowadays in TV. Another social media platform that is very influential is Weibo. Weibo stands for microblogging, and it sounds exactly the same as a scarf, Weibo. So when people say they are posting on Weibo, people also refer to it as knitting a scarf. And knitting a scarf has never been an easy feat since Weibo started. So at the early stage, it encouraged a lot of celebrities to join the platform in order to attract more users. And these celebrities included Mike Tyson. And this former world's heavyweight champion, after he opened his account on Weibo in 2013, the first question he asked, of course, is, who is the best fighter in China? And the most voted reply was, Cheng Guan. And Tyson was like, who is this Cheng Guan? A tough guy? I've never heard of it. So it turns out that it is an insider's joke among Chinese netizens. Because Cheng Guan stands for urban management, which is short for Urban Administrative and Law Enforcement Bureau. It was um, established in early 2000s to be in charge with enforcement of urban regulations in most major cities in China. And it has less power than the police, so to make up for that, they just use a lot of violence and brutality. And this is one picture of um, what they normally do. And a lot of times when they came for inspection, uh, inspection that some street vendors, if they don't run fast enough, they would get beaten up and sometimes to death. So people, are really, people really hate them, but they cannot um, do anything. They cannot report them. It's a governmental agency. So Cheng Guan eventually became a popular target of jokes and internet memes. Um, um, so, for example, that um, people would say, don't be too Cheng Guan, which means that don't bully people. Another famous incident on Weibo was Winnie the Pooh got censored, and I think many of you have heard of that. So, um, actually, a lot of when you heard about it, I guess mostly in 2017 when Western media picked it up, it was already too late because it started in 2013 um, when Obama met, met with Xi Jinping, the current Chinese leader, um, who I will refer to as Xi, um, so don't confuse it with the female pronoun. Um, the comparison between their picture with Wayne and Tigger apparently is too agitating and it was ordered to be removed from online, um, so, uh, like Weibo and WeChat which is the messaging app that every Chinese use. Um, however, fortunately or unfortunately for someone that with our current limited technology, an image once seen can hardly be removed from people's mind. So in 2014, 
disappeared and got banned again. And then in 2015, when she was inspecting the Chinese military during a parade, some people um, were again circulating this cute image, you know, harmless uh, plastic Winnie the Pooh toy car. Um, but, um, oh, the, there's a statistics according to Weibo Scope, which is um, a project by, at the University of Hong Kong Journalism and Media Center. They have monitored this type of censorship on Weibo since 2011, and they said this image was shared 65,000 times within 69 minutes before it got deleted, which means that's 15 times per second. So as Xi's power gets more and more centralized, finally at the beginning of 2018, he announced that um, he's going to remove the presidential term limit, which basically means that he can rule indefinitely. Um, at this point, the, lim the list of censorship gets really ridiculous, and it was reported that the phrase not agree, 不同意, was also censored. So you cannot even say 不同意. I do not agree. Because because of this hyper censorship, people's creativity also peaked. In order to express their dissent, Winnie the Pooh was again chosen as the for political satire. And this one was an old post from Disney's official account on Weibo in China. It was dug out um, with a photo of Winnie the Pooh hugging um, a pot of honey. And it says, find a thing you love and stick with it. And someone dug it out, reposted it, and commented on it saying, wow, godlike prophecy. <laughs> um, and there was also other memes, including one of my favorites. Um, my mom said I must get married within Xi's term in office. I finally breathed out a sigh of relief. And then there's also other very creative acts, including this one, a cosplayer wearing the royal dragon robe and drawing the comparison between she and the emperor. Um, and also this protest, people carry um, a little toy, Winnie toy, and um, put on the outfit that is commonly seen during Cultural Revolution and carried it to the front of Hong Kong uh, Chinese liaison office because this happened in Hong Kong in order to perform an enthronement ceremony. Um, the same week, I was actually in Hong Kong myself and I bumped into a former colleague of mine who um, at the time lived in Beijing. So we were talking about how ridiculous the censorship gets nowadays and she told me how people had to use Hei Hua, black words, um, which means secret language to communicate and in order to circumvent the censorship on social media to avoid being invited to have some tea with the police. So um, basically, this is how people refer to when you say something online that you're not so supposed to. Um, first step, you might get thrown into a little dark room, not physically, but digitally, which means that your account gets suspended for a limited period, or your account gets bumped, which means that your social, uh, your online social identity simply just disappeared. And or one step before you're thrown into jail is you will be asked by the police to come have some tea. And that simply means that they will bring you into the police station and ask, uh, interrogate you or just threaten you not to do it again. So in order to demonstrate how people use secret language, she invited me into a feminist-themed WeChat group with mostly female Chinese artists and art professionals. Ironically, the name of the group was very similar to one of the most beloved Japanese porn star, um, whose name in Chinese characters is Fan Dao Ai, literally means Rice Island Love. So in the group, all the members changed their allies to Rice something. And I soon discovered why it was, because the topic in discussion at the time in the group was Me Too movement in Chinese-speaking art world. Um, so people were very cautious about it. Um, so they adopted Me Too to its Chinese transliteration and chose the characters of Me Too, uh, which means the rice bunny. 
So you might think that um, why would they be afraid of censorship if they're only talking about feminism? Because, well, if you think that is nothing, you're probably too simple, sometimes naive. Because feminism or Western feminism is considered as ideology that the Western hostile force forces, which is a very common phrase that used by the state media, um, were using to attack China's views on women and the country's basic policies on gender equality. And there were many, there were um, some feminist activists got thrown in jail or there were a lot of their social accounts got suspended. So here comes the most controversial and uh, confusing part. Um, not only the Chinese government didn't like the feminist discourse, um, also some Chinese netizens seem not liking it either because they find it too baizu, literally the white left. Well, I will explain first what it means and then analyze why it emerged. So baizu was coined in 2010 and it was only amidst the European refugee crisis that it became popular. And Angela Merkel was actually the first Western politician to be labeled as a baizu for her open door refugee policy. She was also called Shengmu, and it literally means the Holy Mother, which was not a praise in atheist China, um, which rather, according to its users, means that someone who is over-emotional, hypocritical, and having too much empathy. The anti bias discourse on China's social media gained stronger momentum during the U.S. 2016 American presidential um, election campaign, when some Chinese students in the U.S. criticized Democratic Party as um, treating Asians unfairly. So they used Baizu to, to describe them. And then these Chinese netizens who have no or little knowledge of American or international politics, especially in regard to immigration, multiculturalism, uh, and minority rights, etc., they just use the term to describe the perceived double standards of Western media. So they, or they also can use Baizu to discredit, discredit their opponents on, uh, in online debates. And then they discover Trump, and who is as conservative, Islamophobic, and anti-humanitarian. Trump was considered as the antidote of Baizu. The white left, the people who dislike Baizu naturally became his enthusiastic supporters. And they would also identify Trump's opponent, Obama and Clinton, as the epitome of Baizu, the white left. Despite, despite the fact that neither of them is particularly humanitarian nor treating migrants very well. And anyone who defends universal values, including Chinese people, would be considered as Baizu as well, especially uh, elites who received good education, um, in particularly Western education. So if, however, things get really absurd when Fox News picked it up and reported on it. Baizu, its little literal translation is white left, according to political scientist Chen Chen Zhang, who wrote a about the term in a recent open democracy piece. Members of the white left are, in the view of the Chinese, quote, biased, elitist, ignorant of social reality, and constantly applying double standards. They only care about topics like immigration, minorities, LGBT, and the environment, and have, quote, no sense of real problems in the real world. They're people obsessed with political correctness to the extent they, quote, tolerate backward Islamic values for the sake of multiculturalism. And on top of that... Oh, so I don't want to play the whole video, um, but it's very funny. But in case you're still wondering why there are so many anti baizu supporters, we could also examine the phenomenon with a supplementary knowledge on Chinese contemporary social reality. Because in the end, Chinese dream is actually not that different from American dream. Um, both worship the, socialist, uh, the social uh, Darwinist logic of uh, survival of the fittest. Therefore, it opposes the idea of a welfare state. Though the wealth gap is widening and the social inequality is hopelessly increasing, 
Many people take on a pragmatism with the emphasis on self-responsibility, leading many Chinese netizens to dismiss str struggles against structural discrimination as naive, pretentious, or demanding undeserved privileges, no different than the right-wing voices that you see in the West. So the anti baizu criticism also fits especially well with the rising China and declining Europe narrative. In an academic-style essay that was retweeted more than 7,000 times on Weibo, the popular microblogging platform, the poster quoted some European philosophers and concluded that the white left as a moral epidemic that will lead the West to self-destruction. However seemingly objective or academic the post is, it echoes with the official narrative of the Chinese government by opposing against the universal values in order to prove the legitimacy and superiority of current Chinese authoritarian regime. So finally, though the whole anti baizu criticism looks like it's completely born out of grassroots, we cannot rule out the possibility that it's a well-orchestrated campaign by the government, or simply that the only safe stand that one can take under the censorship, the only voice that can be allowed in the public sphere. So... Um, oh. And next one, as I mentioned earlier, it could be a um, campaign by the government which is exactly another tactic of Chinese censorship, combining with the Great Firewall, um, is to obfuscate the truth by hiring a large number of internet commentators, which is com uh, commonly known as the 50 Cent Army. And the name comes from um, the allegation that these commentators would get paid 50 cents in Chinese yuan for each post they fabricate. Um, and um, though some speculate that they are probably not paid anything because it's required if you are a party member. And more recently, after many years of the online censorship, another generation has grown up behind a wall. The scary part is that these, these young kids, they have never heard anything um, else except for the nationalist indoctrination since they benefit the most from the economic prosperity of rising China. And they are genuinely proud of the country. At the same time, they were told that the patriotism is a natural human instinct, so they never questioned that. And these people are called um, xiaofenhong, which literally means little pink red. And red is the national color because it's the color of the party, and pink simply indicates that they are very naive. So these people, they idolize China um, and the party, the same way as they idolize their K-pop stars, which means they follow their idols blindly, and they're just willing to do anything for them. And this one is a um, poster circulated on Weibo with the hashtag, our idol is called A Zhong. Zhong comes from Zhongguo, China. And A ah is a way people use to add um, in front of someone's name to endear them, to show endearment and familiarity. And this blind patriotism is accentuated during the recent Hong Kong protest against the extradition bill. So Chinese state media is, not o is only reporting the protest partially. It did not explain the cause of the protest, which is um, the Hong Kong government basically is trying to pass a bill against people's will. Now they mention um, the occasion when two million Hong Kongers walk on the street peacefully in order to protest against the bill. Um, and they never mentioned that the Hong Kong police were using excessive violence either. And they only report that the protesters are secessionists who are trying to destabilize Hong Kong and separate Hong Kong from China, which cannot be further from the truth. And these little pinkles, 
the young patriots um, who have no other source of information but these fake news from the state media are infuriated about these Hong Kong protesters. So they came up with a brilliant idea and they're going to wage a cyber war. So they need to first bypass the Great Firewall and then go to troll the Hong Kong posters on these international platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And that's what it did. So they um, climb over the wall using VPN, which is also illegal in China. Um, so they did that. And at first, there was probably only a small group of people, these little pinkos. And however, it was picked up by CCTV, the state TV broadcaster. And they spoke highly of these little pinkos for their patriotic move. And it further encouraged the behavior. So it kind of formed a positive feedback loop. And uh, I think some of you might have heard about it that on, on Monday, this Monday, that Facebook and Twitter both announced that they have noticed this abnormal behavior and suspended many accounts originated from China on the ground that they are distributing um, unauthentic information about Hong Kong protest. And they, well, they, this, um, this came on Monday, and on Tuesday, the spokesperson of China's foreign ministry um, commented on that when being asked to, he said that um, every Chinese citizen should have the right to say whatever they want to. And I hope that they will eventually come. And here I'm ending my talk with a quote from George Orwell, which is, every joke is a tiny revolution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brusta. <laughs> thankfully, 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 we have some time left for some questions that yeah. I would hope you take. Please uh, stand by the microphones and um, we'll get to you in a second. Hello. Please uh, turn on the microphone for the questions. It's the Chinese government operating. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> okay, so we have a question here. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your talk. Uh, many um, Chinese, especially I guess among the elites, go abroad for university and study in Western universities. And like you said, VPN, I assume, is not completely uncommon knowledge. So they do have access, you know, the little pinkos, they do have access. Do, do you? Uh, is it just they're too like th once they go abroad and, and go back home, are they already, you know, too indoctrinated by growing up with it? Are they? Really is there a move happens. towards the left or you know towards uh, democracy or and do they change their opinions? Mm, it really depends because there are also a lot of uh, state-sponsored media overseas. So, for example, recently there was a response like when New York Times um, reported on this disinformation law, a war um, against Hong Kong protest, that there was this um, American or well, Chinese students who studied in America and they have this WeChat um, media account and they just says, oh, like whatever the New York Times says, it's all fake news. We're not doing that and they're not reporting it faithfully. So I think it really depends. Once you have access to free information, it doesn't mean that you have the ability to think critically. I mean, like you see what happens to America, right? <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Next question, please. So actually, and I forgot to mention in the beginning that you're actually from China. Yeah. I'm and I was wondering, like, as far as I understand, now you live here. Are you not afraid of 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 making this talk, exposing censorship? Um, well, I expect that question because that thought definitely crossed my mind for for a while. I was like, oh, should I do this? But I think. Um, I want to do this talk exactly because um, if I'm too afraid to do this talk, then that is exactly, exactly the effect that the censorship wants to create. So that you are so afraid that you self-censor, 
and I don't accept that. So. Thank you, thank you. It's a small defeat of censorship. Please give her a last round of applause and thank you so much.